In the beginning of 2020, the whole of Australia suffered widespread bushfires that ravaged the country, causing massive damage to natural and man-made environments alike. Although the exact cause of the severity of these fires is unknown, it is suspected that global climate change played a significant role in enhancing its destructive power. Not half a year earlier, Jonathan Franzen of the New Yorker published his article, What If We Stopped Pretending? predicting and commenting on the coming climate apocalypse. In the article, Franzen reflects on the progress of climate change, the seemingly hopeless scientific data, and the inevitability of a catastrophic event well within our lifetimes associated with it. If anything, the last two years have more than confirmed the sentiment of environmental nihilism. People aren't going to change, and we can't do anything to make them. In 2021, the average price of a house in Sydney rose by 30%, following in the steps of the rapid growth of property prices in the US. Similarly, my hometown of Brisbane saw a 25% rise in house prices, marking a much higher and restrictive barrier of entry for new homeowners, many of which are resigned to the fact that they will not be able to own a house for decades, if ever. Large property investment groups are buying up formerly affordable housing at above market prices, driving property prices up, leaving those who used to be able to afford a house unable to. Those within the upper classes are also seeing property investment as a safe and lucrative way to diversify their assets and consolidate their wealth. All of these factors result in many families never owning a home, constantly indebted to their landlords in order to keep a roof over their heads. With all this in mind, an increasing sense of dissatisfaction and unrest is present throughout society, especially within the young and underprivileged. Political instability and division is clearer than ever in recent memory, with the internet serving as a potent fuel to the proverbial fire. Nothing can be done without unity, and unity seems virtually unattainable. In 2012, a group of four teenagers in Sayama City, Japan, put 400 goldfish into their school swimming pool. The act was one of juvenile delinquency, one that inspired Makoto Nagahisa's 2017 short film, And So We Put Goldfish in the Pool. Following Akane, Tamiko, Ryoko, and Mayu, we see them dancing in karaoke rooms, roaming around arcades and cycling around the city. While they idly discuss their intense feelings of discontentment with resignation, condemned to spend their lives in a dead-end town, without love, without the life that has been promised by the media they consume. As they say themselves, the last 15 years of their lives, they have been zombies, dead to the world around them. They wish a war would break out, that their parents would die, that the town would blow up, just so they could break the monotonous grind of living. Akane's family is broken and detached from reality, with her father distracting himself from his wife's infidelity with the TV, and her brother locking himself inside his room, creating vlogs about porn, claiming it makes him feel alive. Resignation is the norm, and dulling the malaise with mindless entertainment is the easiest way to deal with it. Without anything to live for, the people in this town lie flat, doing the minimum to get by in life, consuming, existing, and never progressing. Looking into the future, the girls see only dead-end lives in the footsteps of their parents, without ambition, without passion, but they say that they are happy enough. At a summer festival, the girls scoop goldfish in a game, the fish swimming around in a little box, a fitting image for the sentiment of the girls. Akane laments that she'll spend the rest of her life in this town, trapped in a goldfish game, only to be disposed of in the end. By putting the goldfish in the pool, the girls achieve a brief respite from the mundanity of their lives, a rare moment of expression and rebellion from the status quo. They run with excitement to the pool, squealing and laughing as they reach it.
The act is said to have been done simply because they thought the fish looked pretty in the pool, but Akane questions whether that is true. Perhaps the beauty of the fish is not in their appearance, but rather the act itself, the defiance of it. When they put the fish in the pool, they have been liberated from their small and restrictive homes. The girls see the liberation that they so desire for themselves. The fish explore the seemingly vast expanses of their new home, no longer clumped in the tank where they were caught for fun. But in the end, they can't see the fish disperse. It's too dark. The victory is hollow, as the girls can't even see what they have done. In the end, the fish will be removed from the pool and confined back into a small container, if not killed. The freedom that they experience is fleeting and they will face the reality of their lives. As Akane says, in the end, nothing will change. In the end, what they did was meaningless. Is there anything to be said about a meaningless action? Is the discontent that the girls feel a product of youthful ignorance? Can the young truly know what it is to live, and as a result, make a valid commentary on life? To be young is to be naive, or at least that is what we're told. Fifteen-year-old girls can't understand the complexities of living, let alone rebel against them. Their delinquency is a symptom of immaturity, so we can punish them without considering the reasons they might have done such a thing. Introspection should be done by those without power, as they are without power due to their lack of insight. These attitudes are those that lead to dissatisfaction that perpetuate the hopeless future we are faced with, one of inevitable and irreversible devastation. In the face of hopelessness, we cannot do anything but watch. But as we watch, we may as well put the goldfish in the pool.